Thank you. All right, welcome everybody to our first of hopefully many uh, joint uh, informative sessions with uh, between the Verona Environmental Commission and Sustainable Verona's Green Team. Tonight, uh, we will be discussing how to successfully compost in your own backyard and give you the confidence and the resources to get started. Tonight, besides myself from the Verona Environmental Commission, we are joined by Mike Terry from the VEC and Harry Bass from Sustainable Verona, as well as many of our members uh, in the attendees list. All attendees will notice a Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can post your questions on this tab throughout the presentation, and as they may be answered by Virginia, we'll mark them answered. Um, I would be patient because I think Virginia is going to hit on many of the questions that you may have come here with, but for any questions that aren't answered, we will go through and spend time at the end of the presentation and Virginia will try to answer those to the best of her ability as well. Um, we, Virginia will also be sharing uh, information for the Essex County's spring community compost bin and rain barrel sale, which is an online sale center uh, giving you some reduced pricing on composting and rain barrel equipment. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it on the VEC's YouTube page and our website. It'll probably be on Verona's YouTube page as well. And you can go back in and rewatch or share with your friends. Our special guest tonight is Virginia Lamb of Groundwork Education and Consulting. Virginia has over 30 years experience in recycling, composting, soil health and organic gardening in New Jersey where she has extensive experience working with local governments, universities, nonprofits, businesses, and, and farmers. Virginia has a BA in uh, Environmental Studies from Stockton University and a Master of Science in Soil Science from UMass Amherst. In 2022, she was appointed Vice Chair of the Governor's Food Waste and Recycling Market Development Council. And in 2021, she helped to start a pilot food scrap drop-off program for the residents of her town, Maplewood, where she currently lives and has been composting in her own backyard with her family for many years. So without further ado, please help me welcome Virginia Lamb. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and th thank you for the nice introduction and thank you also to um, both the Environmental Commission and the Green Team. I really appreciate uh, the invitation and the warm welcome. Hold on one second here. All right, everybody can see my screen okay? Yes? Yep. Okay, great. All right, um, and I apologize for leaving the um, uh, the green team off the, uh, the uh, slide there. My, my point of contact was Jessica. I met her at the uh, Essex County Environmental Commission meeting and uh, and then we, we went on from there. So um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you tonight about composting, which is sort of in my experience and opinion, equal parts art and science. And um, it's it's all levels. We'll talk, you know, if you're a beginner, don't worry. If you're experienced, hopefully there'll be something new for you um, tonight, but it'll be all levels and um, a wide variety. Um, so I always like to start with, um, you know, just an overview of what we're gonna cover tonight. So you know what to expect. So we're gonna talk about why compost, which um, you may or may not know, some or all of those reasons. Then we'll talk about some of the basics and ex essentials to successful composting, methods and systems that are available, uses of finished compost, alternatives to backyard composting, and then we'll wrap up with troubleshooting and resources. So our focus is really gonna be on materials generated in the home and primarily food scraps, uh, also with some yard waste included. And I'm going to talk to you about why food scraps a little bit to start off. So why compost? So composting is a really great way to reduce waste. I've worked in many years uh, in recycling and food waste and organic waste makes up like 40% of our waste stream. It makes up a lot of garbage. I'm going to talk about each of these things um, in a little more detail. So waste reduction is, is one of the really important benefits. Reduction of greenhouse gases and how organics management can help fight climate change. And then the creation of finished compost, which is a really great resource. So 
I'm going to talk about each one of those for a second. So in the U.S., we're generating a lot of garbage. We're generating, as of uh, the last year that official figures are available, um, 292 million tons of garbage per year in the U.S., which comes out to about uh, five pounds a day per person, 1,700 pounds per person per year. And that's just household waste. That's not like bulky waste or construction waste. That's just our household garbage. Now, we're recycling a lot. We recycled like 70 million tons of material. And we composted 25 million, but those numbers are relatively small by comparison. And in terms of organic waste, like yard waste and food waste, manure, you know, all these things that can decompose, that's a problem in the garbage. So as I said, up to about 40% is organic waste. And in the U.S., actually globally, I believe, it's like 30% of all food that's produced is discarded which is really a shame and a waste on many, many levels. And in New Jersey, we're talking about a number, minimally 1.3 million tons of food waste in New Jersey discarded every year in landfills and incinerators. Now, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, you know, we're all thinking and hearing about, about climate change and global warming. So I wanted to... to um, provide this information because to me, it's very hopeful about the, the ways in which managing organic waste properly is really gonna help us. So greenhouse gases are things like carbon dioxide, CO2, methane gas, which is CH4, and nitrous oxide, which is NO2. Those are all heats that accumulate, uh, gases rather, that accumulate in the upper atmosphere, and then they trap heat. So the heat is returned back to earth. And th they come from, combustion engines and burning fossil fuels. They come from anaerobic decomposition. They come from agriculture and fertilizers. They come from a lot of things. But where most of the methane gas, which is a really powerful greenhouse gas, comes from, or the third largest source of methane gas, is landfills. It's food waste decomposing without oxygen. That's called anaerobic decomposition. And then it gives off this methane gas. Methane gas is very potent at returning heat to earth. So it's really important to get that organic waste out of landfills and get it into somewhere where it can decompose organically. Also diverting food waste from incinerators. I live in Essex County. Uh, as it, um, as Is Verona in Essex County? I don't even know. <laughs> it is. Yeah, of course it is. That's right. Yes. Yeah, Jessica. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so our waste goes to an incinerator. And so if we can reduce food waste going to incinerators, it's going to reduce emissions coming out of the incinerator. And then using finished compost improves the health of the soil and it helps soil hold carbon and nitrogen in the soil, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So all really great ways to reduce greenhouse gases. In terms of creating a resource, Compost takes something that's a liability, you know, from an environmental standpoint, economic standpoint, um, and it turns it into this really valuable resource. So we're going to talk in detail about that. But just quickly, and don't don't get alarmed if you are a, a feared a feared of the um, periodic table. But I just always like to start with this because a lot of times talks about in environmental issues uh, they use a lot of scientific terminology, and I apologize to those of you who are you know, scientists or know a lot about science. But basically, I like to bring it down to this because I always say, you know, a lot of us just kind of learned science badly when we were young. So then we became like, oh, we don't understand science. But basically, everything in the universe is made up of the elements, right? And the elements are start out, the smallest unit of an element is an atom. And then atoms combine to make molecules, which combine to make compounds. Compounds make everything, right? And in fact... If you look at these, uh, the sort of grayish blue, the hydrogen on the left, and then you see carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, those six elements make up like 98% of everything in our world, including us. So just keep that in mind, all these elements and all these um, uh, molecules and atoms um, cycling around, it is going to relate to composting. And again, just, you know, we think we don't know chemistry maybe, but we know H2O is water, right? We know, we might know methane gas is a CH4 gas. Um, yeah, some of these are solids, some are liquids, some are gases. You see that molecule on the top right is glucose. So that's blood sugar or plant sugar. So it's six carbons and 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. 
And then ethanol is alcohol, right? So that's um, two carbons and six hydrogens and one oxygen. So it's all these, just these combinations. And even in a leaf, I don't know how many of you are vegetable gardeners, but even in a simple pepper plant, there are glucose molecules and uh, structural molecules like lignin and cellulose. And in pepper plants, there's this thing that makes it spicy, right? Capsaicin is the, is the pepper molecule. So I just wanted to show you these because they're all just combinations of all these atoms. And when we compost, we're allowing the opportunity for these things to rearrange and recombine. And just another sort of thing that, you know, maybe we didn't quite get when we were in sixth grade or, um, but is what's called the basic process of life. And that's photosynthesis. And it literally means to create from light. So a green plant has the miraculous ability to take carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere, combine it with water, and then with the energy of the sun, turn it into glucose and oxygen. Right, we've learned this when we were young, right? Plants create oxygen, we create carbon dioxide, right? It's a back and forth for us. So the reason I tell you about this is because a plant, it produces like 30% more glucose than it needs. Um, and I, I want you to think about it for a minute, like what interest would a plant have in producing more food than it needs? And what a plant does is feeds all these soil organisms. It gives away all these sugars so that the fungi and the bacteria and all these microorganisms can eat and transform this stuff in, into nutrients and make nutrients available to the plant. So it's a little um, reciprocal relationship going on back and forth between plants and the soil and the soil organisms, if we do it right. So composting's role in that is that it allows us to feed the soil, feed the soil organisms, which feed the plants, which in turn feed the soil again, right? So it's really about reestablishing cycles and restoring cycles. Okay, any questions on any of that? Because that's sort of the, the sort of background basis of thinking about composting. So I didn't know if anybody had any questions about that stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. So one of the biggest questions is like, what can I compost? So you can compost a lot of things. You can compost uh, vegetarian animal manure, like from horses and cows and gerbils and um, pets that don't eat meat, that were not intended to eat meat. Um, you can compost vegetative fruit and vegetable scraps from, from your kitchen and your garden, uh, green waste and brown waste, leaves, um, you know, plant trimmings. You can compost clean wood waste uh, or wood ash um, and, and straw. Those are just a few examples because there are so many examples of what you can compost that it doesn't really make sense to list them all. However, what you can't compost is a much shorter, more absolute list. You shouldn't compost at home. Um, plants gone to, uh, weeds gone to seed, um, disease or insect infested plants. You see that second picture from the left under the nose is a tomato plant. So tomatoes have persistent like bacterial diseases that even through composting don't get destroyed really at, in a home compost pile. So you shouldn't compost tomato, leftover tomato plants. Um, you see some like, uh, aphid infestation on that plant there. You shouldn't compost really uh, plate scrapings. You should compost what's called your prep waste. Like when you're cooking in the kitchen and you have the raw fruits and vegetables and you're making stuff that you can put in. But after you've eaten, after you've added maybe sauces or or meats or cheeses, then you that stuff shouldn't safely really go in the compost pile. And you also shouldn't compost the waste, uh, the feces of meat eating pets. There's an organization, a lot of you are uh, environmental commissioners and um, green team members. And I, I don't know if you know about this organization called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, ILSR.org. And they're great. They put out tons of open source information that communities can use for free um, to educate the public. And this is just one of their um, one of their pieces that they have out that I like. So when you're thinking about composting, the categories are, there are two categories. There's the green material, the fresh, um, you know, fresh green waste. It doesn't always have to be green, but it can be fresh fruits and vegetables, 
um, eggshells, flowers, um, you know, garden debris, coffee grinds, tea bags, so forth. No staples on the tea bags. And on the uh, fruit and vegetable waste, no fruit stickers. That's like a big problem in, in for commercial composters that fruit stickers um, are very persistent. So those are the green materials. They're high in nitrogen. And then the brown materials are high in carbon. And I'm going to talk about this a little in a little more detail, but those are things, dry, crunchy things like leaves and straw, paper, twigs, uh, and you know wood chips. And those are all the yes things. And the no things, again, cooked food, dairy, meats, uh, meat eating, pet waste. Oh, produce stickers is on their no list. So no uh, like magazine paper, you could put in like uncoated, you know, shredded newspaper or office paper, but no shiny papers. Uh, they have waxes and clays on them that aren't good for composting. And again, no aggressive weeds or um, diseased plants because those will kind of come back to haunt you in a backyard composting pile situation. Um, so does anybody have any questions about the yes and no list? Because that's always one that is, there's some very specific questions about that, but we can also have the questions at the end as well. So there's none popping up now, I'll just continue. Mm hmm Nothing. Okay. So I always like to keep it pretty simple with the actual essentials of composting. So the five things that you need to keep in mind that if you do these right, you, you won't have a problem um, with the composting in terms of finished product or pests or odor or anything like that. And those five things are uh, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen. This is probably the most important one. So that's why it's number one. Um, and I'm going to go through these each specifically. So the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, the volume of materials, the amount of moisture, the amount of aeration or oxygen, and then the surface area, which is like the particle size of what you're putting in there. So, right, this is from the periodic table. We talked about carbon. We talked about nitrogen. The brown materials are carbon. The green materials are nitrogen. And we want a ratio between those two categories of about three parts of the dry brown material to one part of the fresh green material. Now, if any of you have ever um, mowed a lawn, bagged up the clippings and put the clippings in a pile, you'll understand why it's not a good idea to have a lot of green waste because the it doesn't have the structure, it doesn't have the airspace. So it, it quickly becomes a low oxygen environment, gets a bad odor, it's slimy, you know, just becomes unpleasant especially grass clippings, very fine, fine uh, particles. So if we do this combination, if we put in three parts to one part, brown to green, it's amazing. There's enough oxygen and there's enough fuel in there. It's the perfect combination. So to me, that's like the one thing you remember. And, and, and that and the ingredient list, I think are those like the two most important things for successful composting. And the goal, you know, if you've ever done any reading about composting, um, you, you'll see this goal referred to as a carbon nitrogen ratio of 30 to one. Now I just said three to one, right? Three to one, three parts to one. Well, 30 to one refers to the fact that every living thing has a ratio of carbon to nitrogen in it. It's like how many molecules of, of carbon and nitrogen are, are in there relative to one another. So you can see, Fresh green th things like grass clippings, they have a ratio of 12 to 25 parts of carbon to nitrogen, as opposed to wood chips, look, 800 to one. So the dry brown things have a really high carbon number, right? And the fresh green things have a low number. Now, as things age and die, like say leaves on a tree, when they're green, they're higher in nitrogen, but nitrogen is a mobile nutrient. It leaves, it moves all around. So um, that's why that number changes over the life of a living thing. But I just want you to know if you ever come across that number 30 to one, it, that's what it's talking about. And you can compost just high carbon materials. I mean, people have been composting just leaves forever uh, in their backyard. And there's this big move now, right? Do, um, what do they call it? Um, leave the leaves, right? It's, it's a lot, uh, a lot of, promotion coming out from like a lot of environmental organizations, you know, all the benefits of leaving leaves, both for like pollinators and um, reducing yard uh, equipment collection uh, emissions and stuff. But so it's easy enough to 
pile some leaves up and let them sit in your yard. And it takes a while for them to decompose, but you'll get leaf compost after a time. And you can turn that back into your garden beds, which is terrific. So if you never wanna do anything else in terms of organic management, just save the leaves. Um, but if you do wanna help the leaves compost more quickly and you don't have a lot of nitrogen in there, you can help by shredding the leaves and by keeping that pile kind of moist and that will help it decompose more quickly. All right, the second thing is volume. So when you read about backyard composting, the number you see is always like one cubic yard. So that's three feet by three feet by three feet, right? So that's a great volume because it's both large enough for the ingredients to sort of get going, you know, the organisms in the pile to, to eat and generate heat, which produces the compost. And it's also small enough that the pile won't become anaerobic. There won't be like a dense middle that there's no oxygen in. Um, a lot of the commercially available composters though are smaller than, than this, like the earth machine, which the county is having the sale uh, next in April. Um, that's about 19 cubic feet. And I've used one for many years. I've used other commercial composters that are smaller than a yard and they work just fine. You just don't want to get much smaller because you just don't get the, the mass that you need to really have the composting happening. Moisture, the organisms that do the work in a compost pile, they're kind of like us. They like a temperature range of like 55 to 80 and they, they like it moist. They don't like it bone dry. They don't like it soaking wet. Um, so you want to achieve these middle conditions of moisture um, in the pile so that these organisms can do the work and do it well and do it without generating odor or, you know, mess or slime. And again, if, if you're doing a balance of kitchen waste, you know, the green waste to the brown waste, then you don't need to add any water. But if you're at, if you're doing just brown waste, like leaves or straw or wood chips, then you will need to add moisture to that pile to keep it, to keep it going. And then aeration will will follow really if there's a few different ways to achieve aeration in a compost pile. You can physically turn the pile, which I never do. Um, you can layer the pile, which is what I do. And I'm gonna talk about that. That pile on the right has layers of green and layers of brown and that achieves aeration. And then if you're feeling really ambitious, you can put a, a blower, a timed blower system and, and sort of inject air into the compost. But generally within reason, the more oxygen you have in the compost pile, the faster you're going to get finished compost. And then surface area, this is another, the more you have, the better. So the smaller the particles, the faster the decomposition will occur. So, you know, chop and shred to your heart's content and you'll get compost faster. I just want to check the time, sorry. Okay. And again, it's it's like that soil food web I showed you. This is the compost food web. You build it and you, you build it to the right specifications and all these soil organisms will come. And some of them are microscopic, bacteria, fungi. Those are really the doing the, the lion's share of the work in the compost pile. And then there are the larger workers that we recognize like like mites and worms and, and um, you know, pill bugs and sow bugs and, and beetles. And they're all there to do a job. They're, they're all there to obtain nutrients for themselves, to transform organic matter into compost and to liberate nutrients for the soil and for plants. So we're creating, um, I saw a t-shirt uh, a couple months ago, I was on a workshop, uh, this composting company and their t-shirt said microbe farmer. Which I thought was kind of good. They didn't have their livestock is very, very tiny. Now there's a couple of ways that you can compost at home. Um, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, so I have this compost pile, but it's not really getting hot. So a typical compost pile that you're layering, uh, adding to over time won't really get very hot. But if you want, if you want it to get hot and you want compost quickly and you want to destroy um insect and disease infested plants and that kind of thing, then what you need to do is make a batch. And that means you take your whole volume of materials of greens and browns and you mix them together like all at once. So you take your one third of a cubic yard of green, your, your um, what is it right? Like one quarter and three quarters of, of 
greens to browns, you mix them, shred them, layer them, that stuff will get very hot because there's a lot there for the organisms to eat. And you will see that the temperatures can get high. They can get 140, 150 degrees and you can get compost really quickly out of that. Again, I don't do that. Most backyard composters don't do that. Um, and uh, we won't have these really high temperatures. Um, and what happens is over time, as the oxygen gets used up in a pile by the organisms in there, then the temperature starts to go down. But if you were to turn the pile, you can see that bottom right graph. If you were to turn it, the temperature would go back up because you're like injecting oxygen in there. But if you don't want to do that, you can just you know, be content with a lower, slower, a lower temperature, slower compost um, process. And I will get compost out of uh, out of my backyard pile in like 12 to 18 months. And I'm not in a rush. I have a couple of bins going at once. So um, it, it's fine. It's fine with me, but it depends on your needs and how much material you have. Um, so there are a lot of different systems available. You can just have an open pile for yard waste. Uh, actually, I don't really recommend an open pile if you're doing uh, food waste, kitchen waste. I recommend an enclosed pile, and I'm going to show a picture of some of those. But basically, an open pile is perfectly suitable for gar yard waste or for food waste that's already been broken down somewhat, because you don't want to really have any reason to attract any pests. These are the enclosed systems. The one on the left is the earth machine, uh, which is the one that Essex County has for sale. They have a few others actually, uh, the company they work with is having a few other bins for sale, but these all have been around you know, forever. There's nothing really magic about them. They just make it more organized, neater, tidier. They're generally made out of recycled plastic. You know, I've had the one on the right and the one on the left. I've probably had them for 20 years or more. So they last a long time. Um, and they just make it a little more organized and a little more efficient. And then there's tumblers, uh, which are good if you maybe um, are, are concerned about pests because it's very secure, or if you um, don't have the ability to sort of turn and, you know, dig or shovel uh, material because you can put them in at, you know, at waist height and you can just turn the barrel over. Um, they're generally, you know, there can be homemade ones, but uh, the purchase ones are generally kind of expensive. They're like, the one on the right is like $800. Um, but some people really swear by them because they they can make compost in a very um, methodical way. And it's, it's all very controlled and, and they can make it very quickly. Not as quickly as they say. Some of the advertisements will say, you can have compost in eight days, but that's not possible to have biologically stable compost in eight days. So beware, buyer beware of that. Um, whatever system you have, if you have multiple bins, it gives you a little bit of flexibility. So whether you have a multi-bin system like that on the left, or you have, like I do, a couple of different bins that I can start a pile in and then fill it and then leave it and go start another pile, um, it just gives you some flexibility. And if you think you're going to be turning the pile, leave yourself a little bit of space wherever you put um, wherever you put the uh, pile, just a little bit of room to maybe lift it up and, you know, reshovel the stuff over. I'm going to try and show a little video here. Well, you know what? I don't want to interrupt. I don't think I'm going <laughs> to. Um, because it wasn't working so great. The sound wasn't working so great. Sorry. So anyway, what you can do with a bin like this earth machine, say on the left, um, you can fill it up, you know, so I put in my food waste and then my I save leaves. So then I have enough carbon to put in over the summer season. So I'll do a layering, food waste and leaves, food waste and leaves, and it settles down. There's a lot of volume reduction because there's a lot of air and a lot of moisture, but eventually it'll get full, right? So. What I did when I only had one was I would lift the container off. There's no bottom on it. So I'd lift the container off and put it down next door. And then I would flip over the unfinished stuff. And then I would harvest out the compost out of the bottom. So then I would have more room. So I just go back and forth like that. So you can make it work with one bin. It just forces your hand in terms of doing a little bit more work. And I really do no work for my compost. <laughs> Okay, so tools, um, 
I'm I'm not, I don't really think you need a lot of tools. I think a compost fork is nice, which is like a thin tined fork. You can move, you know, fluffy light materials like straw and leaves. Um, a spade is, is a, in my opinion, like the all purpose garden tool because you can dig with it, edge with it, shovel with it. Um, but you can chop things in a compost pile with it too. Like say you put a jack-o'-lantern in after Halloween, you can just sort of chop it up and get more surface area. You could get a thermometer if you're interested in monitoring temperature. Um, there are commercially available turning tools that you can kind of plunge into the pile to like poke it full of air. And then there are um, aerators, uh, accelerators, they're called, that they're, you know, the promise is like that they're going to sort of inoculate your pile with all the biology that it needs to um, to get really going. But uh, now this is Espoma. It's a reputable New Jersey company. They make really a great, a lot of uh, organic fertilizers. And I just don't think that this really helps in the long run. And in fact, Rutgers many years ago did some studies and they showed that with piles that had starters added, they, they got hotter quicker, but then over time they sort of performed the same as piles that didn't have any additives. And some people add things like, I like to sprinkle in sometimes a light a bit of grass clippings. Um, some people have recipes that involve beer and molasses or or soda, you know, all these things that will feed the organisms in the pile and sort of make them, you know, um, more active and generating more heat. All right, so as far as troubleshooting in a compost pile, it's kind of all comes down to like the same answers. So um, if you have a bad odor, like a sour odor or like a rotten odor, then you need more browns, you need more carbon, more dry and more oxygen. If the pile is too dry, then you need more moisture and you need more greens. If you're uh, notice that there are animals being attracted to the pile, maybe there's meat products going in there, or uh, maybe you need to add a barrier. I, I put under my compost bin, I put um, a uh, quarter inch hardware cloth, I just put that on the ground. So then, you know, nothing can burrow in from underneath. Um, you know, and I'm talking about voles and um, raccoons, things like that. Um, and also adding browns is, is just always a good idea because it just sort of gives uh, cover to the pile. And again, if the compost is, uh, if it's composting what you consider to be too slowly, maybe see if it's moist enough, um, you know, just think about the ingredient list and think about that ratio of three parts carbon to one part nitrogen and aeration. So using finished compost oops, has many, many benefits. Uh, it improves the health and structure of the soil. It, as I talked about, feeds the life in the soil, which makes minerals. Minerals can be in the soil, but they can be chemically bound up and unavailable to plants. So if we improve the biology of the soil, then we liberate the nutrients to the growing plants, which is what we want. And then we don't need so many fertilizers. Um, it Adding compost moderates the moisture and the temperature of the soil, and this reduces stress on plants. And when we, we reduce stress, it's just like us. When we are less stressed, we are less susceptible to disease and illness, right? So we want our plants to be healthy and to be hydrated, and then they're better able to combat pests and diseases. Um, there are many studies that show how utilizing compost suppresses pathogens in plants. And then again, as I mentioned with, um, with the climate, uh, the greenhouse gases and so forth, we adding compost to soil allows the soils to hold more carbon. And there's more carbon in the soil then there's less carbon-based gases up in the atmosphere so it's really a great thing to do to i mean there's all kinds of you know agricultural movements and there's a whole movement in france about the the amount of uh benefit we could do to uh climate and warming if we just took care of our soils and added organic matter to our soils and then also um adding Compost neutralizes the pH or the acidity of soil, which again goes back to liberating nutrients. So just like I showed you the um, periodic table, this is like the plant periodic table. So plants need 14 nutrients for growth, just same as us. Um, so some of them are macronutrients you've heard. I'm sure if you've ever bought a fertilizer, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, right? NPK, those are needed in large amounts. 
And then the secondary macronutrients are magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. And then the others, which I won't read to you, uh, are the micronutrients. So they're needed in small amounts, but they're still essential. So a, a well-made balanced compost has all these. It has, it has the whole complement of nutrients. Whereas if you buy a bag of fertilizer and it just says 10, 10, 10 on it, it has 10% by weight, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And it might be, you know, um, based uh, a synthetic fertilizer, um, which doesn't really do anything to help the soil. And to the pH issue I mentioned, um, so pH is the measure of soil acidity, alkalinity. So the more acid a soil is, the lower the pH is, right? So 4.0 is a very acid soil, right? And then on the other end, it goes from zero to 14. Um, so, but those are pretty extreme. So in the middle, a neutral pH is like 6.5, 7.5. And that's how you can see that nutrients are most widely available, right? Now, some of those nutrients toward the bottom, they're not as widely available, but guess what? Plants don't need them in large amounts. And in fact, say with the case of iron, um, if a soil is too acidic, uh, there can be iron toxicity, right? Iron's too available. So for our home gardens, our landscapes, our vegetable gardens, we wanna, we wanna shoot for a neutral pH, 6.5 to seven, and then nutrients will be chemically available for plants to take up. But I do recommend if you haven't to do a soil test, uh, you know, and you do it by your different types of uses at, at, in your garden. Like if you have a vegetable area, you do a soil test for that. And if you have a shrub area or a flower area, you don't, or a lawn area, you, you separate each different use and you send that out for a different sample. And it's pretty simple. The uh, instructions are online and um, it costs about $20 for a basic nutrient sample and recommendations. I just think it's good information to have. And um, using finished compost, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big reduction. There's like an 80% reduction in from original volume because of uh, moisture and airspace. Um, and it finished compost is a soil amendment. It's not a fertilizer uh, per se, but I don't use anything besides uh, compost in my home garden. I don't use any fertilizers. Well, sometimes I'll use like blood meal or bone meal or, or something like that, but I don't use any uh, commercially available fertilizers. But a little compost goes a long way and you can use it the same way you would use any other soil amendment that you might buy. You can put it on the top of the soil or around the plants. You can mix it in with the potting mix. You can fill a hole with it when you're planting, but only for herbaceous plants, not for woody plants, because for woody plants, it will limit the root spread. So if you're planting a tree, you don't wanna fill a hole with compost. You wanna use the native soil, loosen it up. Um, you can amend it a little bit, but you don't wanna like make it such a nice, rich place that the roots don't wanna go out, right? Cause they can girdle around and they can make, make a woody plant unstable. You can also use mature compost to start seeds. So you can have your own renewable resource going. It's, it's, it's a really great feeling um, if you're doing it already or once you've started doing it. And I mentioned a little goes a long way. Well, a great way to make a little go a long way is by making compost tea. So you mix together uh, 10 parts water to one part compost. Um, you can you can make a weak tea, which you just steep for a couple of hours, or you can steep it for a few days. Um, some people do aeration. They have like fish pumps and they keep it oxygenated because it's a living media. It's 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 got all these microorganisms in there and they need oxygen. And it just has so many benefits, including antifungal properties. And, and plants can't take up dry nutrients. So if you if you have a dry soil and you put down a, 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 a granular fertilizer, it's not gonna, the plants aren't gonna take it up. They need it to be in moisture. It doesn't have to be soaking wet, but the soil needs to be moist in order for the nutrients to be available to the plants. So this is a great way for plants to be able to take up um, fertilizers really quickly. Um, now, I, and Jessica mentioned too, some alternatives. So this is one alternative to backyard composting. Well, two actually. The one is soil incorporation where you can dig your food scraps right into the ground. And I have done this many, many times over the years 
I, you know, uh, didn't have the space outside for a composter or I was renting or so I was just recently on vacation and I buried my food scraps on vacation. Um, I'm a little obsessed. So the other, it's easy to dig a hole and you want to have about a 10 inch, uh, you know, soil covering over top of it. And you just rotate where you plant. You don't, you know, uh, rotate where you dig rather. You don't want to plant right on top of where you're digging, you know, really soon after you did it. Um, but it's great. It's a great way to improve the soil. You don't have to have a compost bin above the ground. It's, it, you don't mind digging. It's, it's terrific. Uh, another way is to compost indoors with worms, with red wigglers. Um, and, um, I don't have one right now, but I've for many years had a worm bin like this in my basement and they can eat half their weight in food every day. So if you started out with a pound of worms, you could put a half pound deli container of food in there every day and it would turn into worm compost every single day. It's really amazing. And they reproduce like crazy because they have nothing else to do. Um, so it's like each worm makes 90 worms in six months. So you can give them away to people. You can put them out in your garden. You could put them out in your compost pile, but they don't survive um, a freeze, these worms. They live in the top foot of the soil and that's why they're so good at um, digesting food waste quickly. Um, Jessica asked me to mention uh, these countertop composters, which, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad she reminded me because I've been meaning to add it in for a time. So you might have seen these ads. I've seen these ads on YouTube for the Lomi or the Lumi, Lomi, I think it is. Um, I saw another one today, this uh, re-ankle. There's, there's another um, thing where you can buy a unit and then it uh, then you ship the stuff off and it gets made into animal feed or something. Anyway, so these units, they call themselves composters, but in fact, the U.S. Composting Council has just taken up uh, the issue because they're like, they're not composters. They shouldn't be called composters. They're, they're macerator dehydrators. So they're chopping the material. Some say you can put um, biodegradable plastic in them even, which makes me wince a little bit. But, um, but so they're chopping the organic matter and drying it, but it's not compost. And it's, impossible for it to happen in like overnight that you can have a soil amendment that you put on your plants. So is it better than putting it in the garbage? Um, I guess, but I just want you to, you know, have all the info and, and like these two units here are, they're $500 a piece and they use a lot of electricity because they run all night and they use heat and they chop. Uh, but I know people who have them and they love them and then they take the stuff and they put it out in their garden. So it's really a personal choice for you, but um, it's really a little misleading to call them composters. Okay, um, there are micro hauler services and uh, you know different collection services sort of springing up all over the place. In Maplewood, we have a, um, a small uh, program where like 80 homes can bring their food scraps to, you know, it's a public area, they pay, what is it? They pay like $12 a month to drop it off. And then the company, the truck in the middle there is called Java's Compost. They haul it away to a composter in Western New Jersey called Ag Choice. So um, there's a couple of different micro haulers around. Some of them, I know like Green Bucket Compost, they haul to a, a place that um, does anaerobic digesting at a, um, a sewer plant. So there's different fates of these materials. Um, so I think it's great that a lot of communities are starting up these collections because, you know, sort of research shows that only like 20% of people will really consider doing a full on backyard compost pile. Like some people just don't want to bother with it. Some people think it's gross. Some people don't have the space. So it's nice to have options that, um, you know, people can take advantage of. And even, you know, it's the, UP, the EPA just came out with an update of the use of this food waste hierarchy, but now they have this thing called the food waste scale. So they're talking about how, you know, we don't start with recycling. Same, we don't start with composting. We start with thinking about how we can prevent wasted food, right? We want to only buy what we need and serve what's needed and, um, you know, avoid having to discard materials. Um, we want to be able to donate usable materials. Uh, to people who need them, usable foods. Uh, there's something called upcycling, which like um, brewers, beer brewers are now taking their spent 
grains and incorporating them into the cereal bars. So there's like a lot of uses for all this organic material because it really represents a lot of energy, a lot of nutrients and a lot of money. So it's really great if we can find better ways um, to utilize it. Feeding animals, leaving um, uh, crops on fields if they're not profitable to harvest, then composting or digestion. And, and then lastly is uh, down the drain or to the landfill or incinerator. Those are the, like, the last options we wanna use for food. And same with yard waste. Like let's think about how we can not have as much of it. It breaks my heart when I see bags of grass clippings out at the curb, even if they're getting collected for composting, because there's so much moisture and so much nutrients in the grass clippings. So if you cut them and leave them, like we do here at our house, and uh, we never water the lawn. It's not irrigated. It's green all year round. So we're returning all this water and nutrients, um, and and we don't fertilize. So our lawn looks looks great. So think about also how you could um, get maybe get rid of lawns. So you don't have that much maintenance and that much waste generated. Just think about things, you know, ways to get rid of uh, of waste. Um, and I know there's a million resources on the internet, but um, a few reliable ones, in my opinion, are, you know, municipal and county recycling offices are a good place to start, as well as uh, local garden clubs. And then uh, Rodale Farms is a research facility in Pennsylvania. And I just, I love their stuff. And I just, you know, searched uh, Rodale Backyard Composting, and I came across this cheat sheet that they had, which is really great. And they have the Rodale Book of Composting, which is like the Bible of composting. And then the EPA has been really doing some remarkable work on uh, food waste because they're realizing just what a missed opportunity it is and how critical it is that we get this organic matter back uh, into use. Um, so again, EPA Backyard Composting was a great, uh, a great hit. And then I mentioned the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which has a lot of great stuff and a lot of stuff you can copy uh, to distribute to your community as well. Uh, like among the last things I'm going to say here, Jessica mentioned the Ca Essex County uh, partners with um, this. Uh, it's a company called Brand Builders, and they have a bunch of different products available. Um, not only these two things, if you go on this website, the Essex dot composter sale dot com and you can see all the stuff they have available and then you pre-order and, and they're available like at wholesale cost because it's a bulk shipment um so um the order the pickup date is april 13th the order deadline is friday april 12th and then the pickup locations are in roseland at the environmental center maplewood we we always have a drop off um a collection here and then we just added one uh, in Newark this year um, at Down Bottom Farms. So you can, if you have your phone right now, you could just take a picture of the QR code and it will bring you right to, um, it will bring you right to the page. But it's great, you know, we we sell generally like, I wanna say we, we've we sold in the past, this is probably our third year. We probably sell, you know, 80 or 90 units a day. And so if you figure, you know, the average household could compost 500 pounds of food waste a year, that's starts to add up. All right, so that's it for me. Um, that's my information. Feel free to um, reach out if you have questions or we have a little bit of time now, right? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes now. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So Virginia. Yeah. We have a few questions. Okay. Um, first off, uh, we have a question from Jonathan regarding the ideal temperature for a heap. Um, is that uh, really reliant upon the type of mechanism that you're using or what, yeah. what's the ideal? It's, it's going to rely, it's going to be a factor of, um, or product rather of what you're putting in and how much you're putting in. So Jonathan, if you had like a one cubic yard pile, that was the right ratio of carbon to nitrogen and uh, was chopped and shredded you could get temperatures of 130 degrees. Um, and again, the higher temperatures, they're gonna like sterilize the pile more, which is good in terms of diseases and insects, but materials are gonna compost no matter what. Like my compost probably goes at about 10 degrees above the temperature of the air, maybe. So it doesn't have to get hot to be decomposing, right? And it's gonna depend on 
what kind of pile you put together and and the the ratio of materials that you put in it. Okay. Relative to that question, we have uh, a mm -hmm. question from BW who says that they're composting in the winter and they have a pile, but they feel like they're just freezing their food scraps. Yeah. Any insight mm -hmm. into winter months? Yeah, yeah. So in it's it's a little late at this point, but yeah, it will freeze in the winter. Um, but it's a good idea to start with an empty pile in the winter, an empty container and, and have your storage of leaves. And that way you have space. So when you have the freezes, but when, when we get these warm days, a lot of times you'll see, it's kind of crazy. The activity will pick up and the pile will drop down like suddenly. So it'll be a fluctuation over the winter. Um, the other thing is like, uh, I was saying that these neighbors of mine had a tumbler and they had it in their garage. And so they would put the food waste in there and tumble it until it was kind of broken down and then they would put it outside. Um, but basically it's gonna freeze in the winter. I mean, more some winters more than others, obviously. But yeah, you just need a, to have a little bit of space to accommodate that happening. Okay. Um, same person asked a question. Uh, besides Rutgers, which I found online, and I'm going to share the link with this individual. What are some good soil testing sites or kits? And then um, a second follow-up question, how would you be able to get rid of aphids in compost? You shouldn't really have aphids in compost because aphids eat, they eat like the growing tip of a plant, right? They're like sucking the, the kind of the life energy out of a plant. So unless you put in uh, aphid infested plants into the compost, I wouldn't think aphids would really be a problem in there. Um, but I mean, over time, there won't be anything for them to eat. As the materials decompose, there, there, there'll be nothing because they want living plant material. Um, and then if you did a hot pile, that would also d destroy um, diseases and insects. So, um, I say between among those those three things that that would be my best advice for getting rid of aphids. Back to the Rutgers question though, um, there is a place um, Penn State people send to Penn State uh, for testing. Um, there's a place called Logan Labs that I've heard recommended. Um, there's a there's a couple. Um, if you probably could search like soil testing labs near me, um, and and find there's. There's not one super nearby, but I know there's one in Northern Virginia. I think Logan Labs might be in Ohio. Um, but they do say to test, use a lab that's kind of in your region because they use different tests and different reagents and stuff. And you want to you want to make sure that it's kind of in the same, uh, that the results are, are kind of comparable or use the same lab repeatedly. Don't try to compare results from one lab to another because they could be telling you very different things. Um, we have a question from Nia who asks, during the composting process, in case there are any pesticides or herbicides, how might this affect compost? And a follow-up, would the environment created in the compost dilute the toxins or just further contaminate the compost? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question um, because it depends. Uh, some chemicals will break down. They'll break down to their component parts, which are like carbon and water in a lot of cases, uh, over the time, over the process of decomposition. Some are persistent herbicides and chemicals, and they will they will take a long, long time. And the U.S. Composting Council has done research because it was a big herbicide persistence problem a few years ago where it was horse feed that ended up in the horse manure and then it was sent to some big composting facility in Vermont and then it was persistent and so it was like you know contaminating all these people's crops and stuff it's kind of a nightmare so they found out that after 18 months then the ke the chemical residues you know broke down after that um so it is good to just as far as possible avoid putting in um pesticides uh into your compost pile or if you know you're putting in material with pesticides, then make sure that that compost sits for a very long time. Because gotcha. it will eventually break down. Uh, Jack asks, is fireplace ash good for a composter or good to add just to the vegetable garden? That's an 
That's another good question. And I had experience with that because when we first moved here, we had terrible, terrible soil and I was desperate to make it better fast because I had left behind some beautiful soil in my old house. So I was um, burying food waste and I was putting in wood ash, clean wood ash, by the way, no pressure treated wood, no paper, um, no, not paper, um, no coated papers, no painted wood, anything like that. Um, it's best to put it in the compost. Because what I was doing was I put a lot of wood ash in my garden and I got really high potassium levels. So it's best to put it in the compost and let it go through the composting process. If you're doing a lot, you could put a little bit, but it's my, the advice I got from Rutgers was not to put it wood ash directly on the garden. Excellent. Um, Jonathan follows up. If you've ever browsed composting on Reddit, you'll see a common <laughs> element. <laughs> I know, to the point of being a running joke. Um, and it says to pee on it. Uh, what's the deal there? Is urine actually beneficial for compost? And if so, and I know he's being incredibly serious here. Yeah. Is urine green or brown? <laughs> urine is, is, has a lot of nitrogen in it. Urea is, that's nitrogen. Yeah. So, so, and I used to have a brother-in-law who peed all around his vegetable garden all the time for, for animal repelling reasons. He's like, I don't need fox urine. I have my own urine. So it's not bad to put urine in a, in a compost pile or in the soil. Um, you know, sometimes if any of you have dogs, you see that um, sometimes if your dog has a favorite peeing spot in the yard, the grass will die there, right? Because urine can burn things, can can kill things, right? Too much uh, of a concentration of urine. So, um, it, it, but it's nitrogen, it's total nitrogen. In fact, last year, there was a story in the New York Times where in Vermont, the, oh, you know, oh no, it wasn't last year. It was during the Ukraine war, right? And fertilizers were very, very scarce and very expensive. I was working with farmers on a research project then and the prices were like triple and people couldn't afford to put down fertilizer. So in Vermont, somebody started out this urine collection business from homes. They would collect urine and put it in these tanks and then they would kind of distill it and then they would use the urine as fertilizer. So pee away. <laughs> Is there any way, uh, this is from Deepak, uh, is there any way to make a composting bin by drilling holes into an old garbage can? I have tried to do this, but I don't think I'm getting enough oxygen. Yeah, it's a regular, you know what's really good? Like a landscape barrel, you know, those big green landscape barrels, because they have enough size, they're wide enough. A regular trash can, you, if you cut the bottom out, maybe submerged it a little bit and cut big holes in it. I mean, like, you know, two inch diameter holes maybe. Um, and then you would have to be very careful with the balance because you could easily go too much green. So I would go heavier on the browns, you know, light on the greens in a container like that, but you can do it, it can be done. Would the holes be drilled at the top so that the material wouldn't spill out? More uh, you can drill the holes all along the side. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sarah asks, would Timothy hay and rabbit waste from their litter box be okay to be dumped in the compost? And does it count as a brown? Uh, manure and hay is brown and green together because manure is nitrogen. So uh, vegetarian animal waste is the perfect combination. Uh, horse waste, um, hamster waste, uh, bird cage clean out. Um, it, it's, all, it's all fine and it's a good, it's a good starting combination of brown and green. Sarah, you know what to do. <laughs> no, no cat waste and no, no dog waste. <laughs> Steen asks, can you use a tumbler continually or are you supposed to wait for it, to, uh, for the compost to empty it and start over again? Yeah. And then how do you pull the material out at, while you're still yeah. building compost? You know, I always felt like, yeah, if you're add, if you're turning and you're adding, then when do you ever get anything finished? But uh, the the tumblers are um, have two chambers in them often, not the homemade ones, obviously. So you can batch one side, and and the um, the one um, just the name of it escapes me right now. The Jora tumbler, it it recommends that you the brown you use is like um, it almost looks like bedding, like like that those little pellets that you use for hamsters or whatever. Um, so it's a it's a compressed soft wood. So you put the food scraps in and then you put these pellets of wood in and then you turn it 
And then you keep doing that until it's full. And then you start filling the other side, the other chamber, and then you can empty the one side and let it cure, let it finish off like in an outdoor compost bin. So you recommend if you have a tumbler to have two chambers? So that most can- most of the made tumblers are, are come with two chambers, I I, I believe. Um, um okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah. actually, no, you know what? That that actually that's not true. The one, the Kemp tumbler is a one chamber um thing. So I would say, and, and some of them say, oh, you're supposed to put the food waste in in a brown paper bag. You know, there's like some very prescribed instructions about using a tumbler. And I'm not like that methodical myself, so I've never used one. Um, But if you follow the instructions that they tell you, um, then you usually can, I mean, I've heard people talk about getting like clumpy materials too. So so I'm not exactly, you know, an expert on those, but I think you can follow the advice they give you. And then you, at some point you have to empty that thing out and, and start over. And it might not be quite finished compost, but it would be like near finished compost. Um, she did add that she has a one chamber system. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, is it, is it working out all right? Or? Well, apparently she, yeah. uh, due to her question, I'm wondering whether, you know, it's yeah taking a long time and then it's, she doesn't know when to start or to stop because it's. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. I feel I feel like, you know, when I was talking about burying stuff in the ground, that's what I used to do when I only had one bin. Because I feel like at some point you got to stop adding, right? Just to let the stuff finish. If you're turning, if you're layering, you don't really have to do that. If you're layering, then the oldest, most finished stuff is at the bottom and the newest stuff is at the top. So that's what I was talking about, that flipping method, right? But if you're constantly turning and constantly adding, then you have always a mixture of fresh stuff and partially finished stuff and finished stuff. So yeah, at some point you got to stop adding and let it finish. Okay. That's why multiple bins. That's I love multiple bins because it doesn't make you have to be so thinky about all this stuff, you know? Uh, we have a comment from Yv- Yvonne who just said, I have very good luck with the maize 65 gallon compost tumbler. So nice. Maize. Okay. Okay. Good to know. No, people who like them like swear by them, you know, people, I, I've, I've met many people who are like, oh no, no, it's really great. You know. Okay. And, um, question again from Jonathan environmentally, is it better to compost or recycle newspaper? It's best to recycle it. Um, yeah, it's like the highest, the highest use, but comp, uh, you can put soiled paper in, um, in the compost. You can, uh, put in some to compensate for carbon. Um, I love to put like um, soiled pizza boxes torn up, you know, that that kind of uh, paper that's not really great for recycling. But the first use is really recycling. And paper doesn't really take the place of plant-based carbon because it doesn't have the structure, doesn't have the cellulose to hold it up, you know. So really straw and leaves and wood chips are better carbon sources um, than paper. With the exception of a worm bin, worm bin uses shredded paper. Thank you. And um, one question, well, I have two quickies. Um, if your compost is too wet, just are you just lacking brown material? Yeah, or maybe it's, uh, you know, getting too much rain. Is it covered? You know, sometimes it's just getting too much rain. So um, a cover is a good idea. But yeah, if it's, it's generally, if it's too soggy and wet, you need to add more dry brown material in it. Gotcha. And can you uh, just address, you said, uh, you used a term earlier, and I think it's an oxymoron, but it you said biodegradable plastic. Plastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot of uh, biodegradable plastic stuff going on right now. And, um, and there's a big debate about what's compostable and there's like state legislature pending in a lot of states. And, and it, it's a really complicated thing because it's like about what breaks down and does breaking down mean it's biodegradable? I mean, you know, because things can break down to microscopic plastic and still be plastic. Right. Um, so it, it, it's a, it's a hot, hot button issue right now. And, and like food service people want to make 
food service items that compost so that they can continue to make them, right? And that they can not be, because the scourge of plastic that we're all aware of now um, is under a lot of scrutiny. So people want to create plastics that don't persist, but it's, um, it's complicated. <laughs> Mike and Carrie, do you guys have any questions? Uh, no, I don't. You don't. I don't either. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think I think uh, the program is over. Unless anybody has anything to add, Jonathan, you're welcome. I just got to thank you. I thank think, you. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Great questions. We had a pretty decent uh, turnout for this, and I really appreciate everybody coming out and so appreciate your time and your hard work, Virginia. Oh, thank you. Uh, was awesome. We, we're getting a lot of thank yous from people saying it was Thanks, great. Thanks, everybody. And I appreciate everybody's interest and commitment. It's, you know, it's a great rewarding issue. It's a great rewarding thing to do, in my opinion. It's like easy results and, you know, you see the good right away, so. <laughs> Um, and for anyone, I'm just going to type it, okay. I'm going to type it into the last thank you I got. I'm just adding the composter sale uh, oh, shop, great. shop link thank you. and um, putting that out. And uh, just so that people know, they can start ordering those items today. The, yep. sale the, store, the store is open. That's right. I wanted to it's see if I could a, go the back. Last the orders have to be placed by the 12th and picked up on April 13th. And the closest place right. to pick up to Verona is at the Essex uh, Essex County Environmental Center on Eagle Rock Avenue. Right. So, at, um, at like 10, 10 to 1130 or something like that, right? 9 to 1030 a.m. 9 to 1030. April 13th. Yeah. Right. So yeah. And I think we were, they, already, they, they already picked a September date, too. Um, so there's the, we're we're doing it. This is the third year we'll be doing it twice a year. So um, and the September date is during some shrub sale or something. So all good. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. And again, this thank you on, on uh, Verona's and the VEC's YouTube and Verona's website. So thank everybody thank, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Awesome. All right. All right. Have a good Take night, care. everybody. All right, you too. Thanks. Bye.